welcome, Ken. Michelle, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, so happy to have you here. It's always such a pleasure. I just really, really resonate with your work and with who you are. And I just think you're doing such important things out there in the world, Ken. And so it's mm. truly an honor to have you here. And an honor to be here. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. So Ken is a relationship coach, speaker, author, podcaster of the Deeper Dating podcast. And his book, his wonderful book, is called Deeper Dating, How to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. And one of the things I really love about you, Ken, is that your work goes beneath the surface. This is not just a few little tips and tricks and that sort of thing that we so often hear out there. You really get to kind of like the heart of the matter, if it will, and really help, if we, if you will, and really helps people to make real tangible changes and create really powerful opportunities in their lives. And so I really appreciate that about the way that you work and the work that you do and the depth and the level of things that you go to in your podcast, mm -hmm. in your book. Thank you so much. You know, I, I have been um, a licensed psychotherapist for 35 years now, although, you know, I've, I've closed my practice to that, but I have 35 years of background doing, you know, the deeper, deeper therapy work. And all of that has informed what I teach in terms of dating. So I appreciate you saying that. And and I will also say that as someone with um, a kind of anxious um, attachment style, and as someone who was single for decades, decades, chronically single. I even started a support group for chronically single psychotherapists. As someone who has really been through that, looking for love and failing again and again and again, and it's not like I wasn't looking. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I really, really deeply, deeply, I'm humbled by this journey and I'm humbled by the kind of milestones that I have learned that in this path, there are roads we can take that lead to intimacy and there are roads we could take that look like they're leading to love, but they're just leading to pain. And I've just really tried to identify what are those forks in the road and what are the, what are the hallmarks of choosing the paths that lead to warmth and intimacy and connection as opposed to a great deal of pain. And I've just devoted my life to creating maps, creating maps that help people orient themselves toward the deep goal, the true goal, which is a beautiful, caring, intimate, loving relationship with someone who is good and decent and available and adoring. And that's mm -hmm. the journey. Yeah, that is the journey. And for many of us, like you and I, Ken, it feels like it's the journey of life, or like the journey of our lives, because I, like you, had a, just a terrible time, just, you know, just struggled out there in the area of love, even though I felt like in every other aspect of my life, I could figure it out and I could succeed and I could see that path forward. When it came to my love life, it just felt like I was hitting my head against the wall again and again. And like you said, going down some of these detours and oh, the pain, I mean, painful, right? Excruciatingly painful. Because you really want it. Yeah, because you really want it. And and as much as you try to fill your life with other things or you try to suppress those feelings, what I found, Ken, is that sometimes at the most unexpected times, this desire and this feeling would rise up and would just be so overwhelmingly powerful. And I would realize, wow, you know, this is really important to me. No matter what else is going on in my life that's good and beautiful and wonderful and satisfying, there was a, a void and an emptiness that caused a deep and profound pain. And I had a really difficult time. And it wasn't until I got support and I got help and I could see how without meaning to, my thoughts and some of my actions were sabotaging me that I was able to make some breakthroughs and make some shifts that allowed me to then draw in and meet an amazing, wonderful husband and now have a 14 year marriage. But oh, the yes. journey, oh, the journey. Oh, the journey, it's so true. And um, 
I have a thought I want to say about the longing, but first, if I could just turn the tables for a minute and ask you like for a gem, which is what was the biggest thing you learned in your turning your process around and all of that learning, what was the most central important learning for you? I'm just curious. Well, the, you know, it's hard to identify just one for me. I think one of them was that um, although I believed and thought that I was doing everything I could, that there were these ways that I was self-sabotaging that I could not see on my own. I had to get some support around totally, those. Totally, and once totally. I did get that support and I could see them, then it was like it empowered me to be more in choice about how I allowed those or didn't allow those to influence me or to be kind of like under the surface running the whole show without me realizing it. So I agree. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I learned, I began to learn how to stop self-sabotaging. And I guess the, the second part of that again is that I felt more empowered. I felt like it wasn't just luck or it wasn't just the, you know, some people are lucky in love and I'm not, or the, the forces out there, it's the fault of all the men or the, all the good ones are taken or whatever. I began to feel like I could have an impact and an influence on what I drew into my own life. Yes. Also, I got really clear about, and I know you and I have talked about this before too. I got really clear about what wasn't right for me, who wasn't right for me. And I I began to have the courage and the strength to stay true to that instead of going down these detours. Because one of my challenges was I would get tangled up with into relationships where I kind of knew that probably wasn't going to work out, but it was who had showed up. And I kind of felt like, oh, I better give that a chance or I might miss out. And then it was like that original wisdom was always right. And so once I got clear about what was really right for me, I no longer went down these detours because I believe one of the keys to finding the right person is not being tangled up with the wrong person. doesn't mean they're a bad person, but if they're not available or able to be there for you for whatever reason, even if they're a really nice person and have some nice qualities or there's that crazy attraction that we've also talked about, they can still be the wrong person. And that's where it yes. gets so confusing. Yes, yes. Well, you just said a lot. You said like gems. And I want to talk about each of the different, you You just kind of guided me in some of the things that I want to talk about. Because you talked about, and I'm just going to list some of the things you just mentioned that are so important and so beautiful. And taking this journey as a wisdom path, which is something that we both really, really believe in. This is one of the greatest journeys of your life. And what you are going to learn if you take this on as a wisdom path is going to affect every relationship, including your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your pets, your family, a spiritual relationship, if that's something that, that fits for you, because it's a wisdom journey, because it's a journey about intimacy. And this is what I say all the time. The skills of dating are really nothing more than the skills of intimacy, which are the greatest skills of all for a happy and rich life. So, I, Michelle, I just want to take some of the things you said and just kind of like hold them up. So one is your longing, the power of longing. Our longing is the rocket fuel that gets us out of the gravity zone of our self-sabotage. Oh. The pain of longing is so important. And, and, and here's what I want to say to everybody. When you find yourself doing something very similar to what I've done and what Michelle described, which was allowing yourself to feel the truth of your longing and let it reverberate through you, even though it hurt, even though it ached, that's wisdom. That is not a mistake and that is not weakness. That is wisdom because we are built to need love. Love is our oxygen. Without it, we wither inside and we turn into less wonderful versions of ourselves. So when you hit the point that, that, that your longing is coming up, that you're not numbing it, or burying it, but instead feeling it, you've come really far. And uh, it says great things about your personal and spiritual evolution. 
Hmm. Second, what do you do with that? Well, the first tendency is to do what you've always done before, right? You feel that terrible longing and it hurts and terrible, wonderful longing and it hurts. And um, cause I remember, I remember uh, in my thirties, I would visit friends who were married, were in relationships and I would sleep in the guest bedroom alone and I would know that they're, you know, in the other bedroom being together and being connected and having that thing that was just so amazing to me, like little things like just because I had never been in a long term relationship um, until I was um, really in my 40s. Uh, yeah, really until I was in my until I was 39. That's what it was. And I had my first long term relationship, long term ish, like a year. Um, but anyway, like people would go on trips together, they go on vacations. And I would just think to you, that's like nothing to me, that would be a miracle that would be so incredible. But anyway, so what do we do? We, you know, when we feel that longing, we go down our typical paths. And the first, the next thing that you said was you identified those hardwired paths that you thought would lead you to love, but didn't lead you to love. That's a huge deal. And then you committed to changing them, which is like, you feel your longing, you admit how you're fleeing love, you commit to getting support in changing them. Half of your entire journey with that is completed and healed. Half of your journey at the very least. So uh, I, these are not little things. These are huge, huge things. So I want to acknowledge all of those. And then I want to say... I talk about um, two different circuitries of attraction, and I could say more about that later. Attractions of deprivation, which are the ones that feel like love and they like grab you and they pull you and you ache and you long and you sweat and you desire and it feels like this is the person I need to have the love I dream of, but they're not available or they don't treat you right, or they don't have the kind of level of character that you need, or they drink too much. And when they drink, their personalities change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you try to make it work anyway. It's like you try to prove to yourself and the other person that you're worthy of the kind of love you dream of. And that's the, yeah, that's the that's essential That's driving path. and proving of trying to and when we often get into like trying to pretzel ourselves into who we think they want or who we yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. That pretzeling is such a sign, that uncomfortable pretzeling, which, you know, this is a rich, rich intimacy tool. It's the tool of authenticity. And this is a question for all of us to think, not just in dating, where am I pretzeling myself or where am I really unfurling the dignity, the space, the goodness, the truth of who I am. The more we're doing the second thing, the more love will want to come to us. The more love will search for us in all areas of our lives. And that's why this is a path that fills me with so much hope because there's a deeper physics to dating. And the tools that you talked about, those three tools are so huge in that. And so then the other circuitry, that's the attractions of deprivation, all that we're talking about here. The other circuitry, which all of us have, even if it might be buried, is attractions of inspiration. And that's when we're attracted to someone because they're actually available and they're actually good and decent and kind. And they have like a really good, solid character and they're they care about us. Now, these people often seem a lot less spicily delicious at first than the attractions of deprivation because we have to develop a taste for availability. And for those of us um, who struggle and have struggled with issues of self-esteem and who have been stuck in patterns of not choosing the right people, there is a way that we... Um, to really meet someone who's available and doesn't go anywhere and really likes us, it's like holding up a mirror to all the thoughts of, 
oh my God, if they see this part of me, they'll run. When they see this mm -hmm. part of me, they'll flee. All these feelings of shame. And what's the smartest way to protect yourself? Fool yourself that it's time to leave. Fool yourself that you're not interested enough. So our unconscious actually does that. It actually creates, and I'll talk more about this later, something I call the wave, which I think is the single biggest destroyer of healthy love. The way we experience it though is, nah, that person's a little bit boring, or I wanna go back to the thrill of the hunt. So, because we get afraid and we have to cultivate a taste. I, I know for me, before I did the work that we are talking about, Michelle, I wouldn't have stayed with the person who became my husband and my beloved, with whom we have three children together in a very wonderful, rich life. I would have fled him in a minute because he was too available and I thought it was boring. Mm -hmm. He's really smart, but he's really simple in his character. It's a solid, decent, no need to prove myself kind of character. I had to learn how valuable that is. So there's a learning of, 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 of kind of the beauty in availability and decency and integrity that people like me need to actually cultivate a taste for. But the great news is we can. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the things my husband and I have discussed from time to time that goes right along with this, Ken, is over the long run, there are a few things that are sexier than having someone there you should there for you every single day. It's um, so true. You know, it's so true. And, um, and the research shows things like what the real effort, let me, I'll just name a few aphrodisiacs in healthy love. One is going to deeper and deeper levels of vulnerability. Scary, scary, taking the leap and having the person not run and be there and accept you. That's terrifying, but it's really sexy sitting across from the table with someone and you're talking about someone and you look at their face and they're really listening. They're really listening. Looking at somebody looking at you and you see how much love is in their face for you. These things are the true glorious aphrodisiacs because when you have kindness and goodness combined with romantic and sexual attraction, what is a happier thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, coming back to those um, just for a second to those um, attractions of deprivation. Some of us are so used to that and used to that striving. And I think it can almost feel like an addictive kind of quality. Yes. Go yes. Up, uh, after those people, almost like if if we could finally win or earn the love of that person, then that would give us that reassurance that we really are okay right and so Absolutely. those things can feel so they can feel so tempting to go after that kind of a relationship especially if we become kind of accustomed to that drama and that anxiety and that like striving and that how almost but it's not quite there it can be like so tempting to to go down those traps it can because, and, and just to say something about why that is, it touches something um, that I call the myth of lost love. And what that is, is like all of us growing up didn't get exactly the love that we wanted, um, the seeingness, the mirroring of all of our quirks and qualities. But the ones that really count that weren't honored as fully as they need to be, something inside us is orphaned, is abandoned, and feels unlovable. So when we find a person who can almost love us, but they don't quite almost be all those positive things, but not quite, it triggers this ancient myth in our being. And we think, I'm finally, we don't only just think, every level of our being feels this is the person who can heal this wound. This is the place where love is finally going to come to me and I'm going to be okay. When this is triggered, it is not a little thing. But when it's triggered in a way like, um, you know, in gambling, there's something called um, intermittent systems of reinforcement. And what that is, is sometimes you win, sometimes you don't, but you cannot figure it out. 
Um, so these intermittent reward systems, which are like, you know, gambling, are in fact the most powerful behavioral sculptors. Um, they, they sculpt us powerfully. That's like, you want to get somebody, you use an intermittent reward system if you want to get them in a really not good way. That's gambling. And that's like, you know, oxyto uh, I'm sorry, dopamine is um, the, the chemical, the brain chemical that, that is like when you win the, um, like when you win the, uh, um, you know, whatever it is, whatever gambling machine, the roulette machine or whatever it is, when you win, you get a dose of dopamine. When you're swiping and you get a match, you get a little dose of dopamine. And um, this dopamine is like, oh, I got what I wanted. The joy does not last. But being in a relationship like that is, in a, is like being in a dopamine drip where you never know when you're going to get it. But wouldn't you rather be in an oxytocin drip, which is the, the brain chemical that is um, it's called the cuddle hormone. It's what you feel when you feel safe and loved and caressed and seen and good in the world with yourself and with someone else. That's what you feel. That's the wonderful feeling that you feel in a healthy relationship. So it's a shifting from something much more edgy and spicy. It's shifting from something that fills you from the outside in to shifting to something that starts in your insides and fills you up from the inside and radiates out. That's what we're looking for. And that is somebody with good character who loves you and treasures you. That's an attraction of inspiration. And that was the other thing you said, Michelle, too. You made a decision that no matter how sexy the other ones were, you were only gonna choose attractions of inspiration. That's right. It's a huge choice. It's a huge choice. And I know that all these lessons in your coaching, which is why I love sending people to you for your coaching, that all of these lessons are what you teach. And so few people teach this journey as a true path of wisdom. But that's what it is. It is a true path of wisdom. It really yeah. is. And like you're saying, these are not small things. When when these things become clear to you and when you have an understanding of these things, it can transform what is possible. Like you just said, when I made that decision that I was no longer going to chase after these, you know, bright, shiny people, they're bright and shiny in different ways, but not available for whatever reason for me, not fully available, even though they have great, some great qualities and some sexy qualities. And even though I feel drawn in that direction, when I got really clear about what it was that I really wanted was a deep, loving, committed partnership relationship and that I knew that I could fully give my heart and my energy and my commitment to someone. And I deserve to have someone be able to do that back, be in that partnership together. It changed everything for me and it was empowering for me because I no longer just felt like I was out there floundering around and getting into all these situations where I then would say, how did I get into another just painful, painful situation here? Yes, how did I get here again? And um, I, I wanna shift a little bit now to talk about online dating in this okay. age of COVID because that has been kind of very much the focus of my work um, because online dating is built to sculpt the very behaviors that you and I are talking about not working. And I wanna say some things about how that happens. So to take what you and I are talking about and apply it to the world of online dating, is it doable? Absolutely. Is it like running up a down escalator? A little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, because, because for example, swiping apps, uh, the research shows that they lead to increased anxiety and depression. Um, the, the biggest one of all is Grindr, the gay men's um, hookup app. 77% of experiences make people miserable on that app. Oh, uh, it's, painful. yeah, I think Tinder is, 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 um, it's better, but it's also, you know, not necessarily so great. But of course, you can occupy all of these systems and use them. To, you can harness the power of the internet to use them. But what happens is, 
when you go into what I call swipe circuitry, I was just interviewed in the Times about um, dating during the pandemic. And I was talking about this concept of swipe circuitry, which is when you're swiping, 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 you go into a mode where you look for your scratch the itch type. What you look for is immediate attraction. But the minute all you do is look for immediate attraction and think everything else will follow, you're in big trouble. You want to look for attraction, of course, but it doesn't have to be intense. There just has to be some degree of spark. And then you want to look for inspiration. You want to look for inspiration hard on a swiping app, although they are becoming more dimensional and richer. Um, but that's what you want to look for. And when you look for inspiration, my dear friend, Hara Morano, who is the editor at large of Psychology Today, says that there are three C's in finding love. And the first is character. The second is character. And the third is character. And it's so true. <laughs> I love it. I know. I love that too. And we all need to hear it. Um, and that's true, you know, in all kind of arenas. Um, but so when we, when we start looking for that, our dating life becomes different. And actually, I have spent the past few years developing what I consider a dream platform for single people to mate in a way that doesn't just incubate matches, but it incubates intimacy. And it's called deeperdating.com. And when you go there, you see we have events where people talk about things like talk about an object in your house that has a lot of meaning for you. Talk about a pet that you really love. And they meet people answering these kind of wonderful questions in groups and pairs. And then they get to interact based on the real skills of intimacy. And we're getting an amazing response and growing really rapidly because what we're doing is bringing wisdom and respect and kindness to the world of online dating, which has been kind of sorely lacking. So this has been kind of the project of my heart that I've been working on. And but, but the skills that we're talking about are the skills that we teach on that platform and that I teach and that you teach everywhere. These simple skills that are about bringing humanity and wisdom to your search for love. Mm -hmm. and, and Michelle, if I could just say one other thing about this that I think is huge, huge, is that there's a magical thing that happens when you choose to follow the kind of path that Michelle and I are in lockstep agreement about. And that thing is, and it's unexpected, your sexual and romantic attractions will actually begin to change. You'll find yourself like somehow, like almost like, how is this happening? But I'm meeting kinder, more decent people. How did this happen? But it happens. And I'm not wanting to run for the hills all the time, every minute, at least. And they're interested in me too. These Beautiful shifts begin to happen. And this is just, it's truly, I would say, just about a promise that if you follow the things that we're talking about, you will see that occur. And my book, Deeper Dating, and my online course, um, as well as my podcast, Teach the Steps, provide an actual course and a map step by step to accomplish these things. And that's kind of because it is a process of stages. And um, when we learn those stages and take them, especially if we take them with another person, a coach or a friend who can work with us, the changes are profound. Folks, don't try to do this all alone. As smart as you are and as wise as you are, you're not going to be able to get out of your own way when it comes to entrenched habits. We need the presence of a loving other to help us. Yeah, because I feel like, Ken, um, you know, like I shared, it wasn't until I got support that I could start um, really moving yeah. forward. I, you know, I got to that point where I'm like, well, I sure have given my plan a try. And if you've been stuck for a while, it's kind of like, you know, we look in the mirror every day and we can see ourselves and we think we see ourselves really clearly. We're not seeing the side view. We're not, heaven forbid, seeing the rear view. Like All the blind spots, yeah. The blind spots. It's like uh, I could not, and uh, and I did a lot of work on my own. Believe me, when uh -huh, I got uh -huh. before I got support. I mean, I read a hundred. Me too. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I read 125 books, Ken, I kid you not, in 18 months about love, dating, relationships, communication. And I did get some gems from those books, but I still had my own blind spots that I could not see without without some support. So it's, it's not so like true. Deep work. I was I was doing everything I knew. Yes. And it's not enough with the habits. There's actually an interesting piece of science around this. Like if you're in the woods and you know that you need to go in a certain direction, let's say somebody tells you this is the direction, just go in this direction and you will get out of your, you know, out of the woods and into town. Just go in that exact direction. So you say, okay, I could do this. There's a tree that's exactly at that point. I'm going to walk to that tree. Then you walk to that tree and then you put your hand out in the same way. You say, okay, that tree is in exactly the same point. I'm going to go to that tree. I've got to get where I'm going. Well, here's what's going to happen. You are going to make a really, really long circle and come back to the same place. Your best thinking, this is what they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, baby, it's your best thinking that got you here. You know, (laughs) your best thinking isn't good enough. (laughs) Right. I love that. That's great. Yeah. That's great. They don't say the baby part. I say that. (laughs) I like the baby part. (laughs) Hmm. Um, So I know you promised to share with us a little bit about this wave concept. Oh, yeah. So I want to make sure we don't leave people hanging on that. Beautiful, beautiful. So um, this is what kept me single for decades, more than anything, anything else. This was the thing that kept me single. And when I speak in front of groups and I ask people, do you relate? I would say it's rare that under a half of the people don't raise their hands, usually between a half and two thirds. And here's what it is, is what I call the wave of distancing. And this is what it is. And maybe some of you will relate. You meet somebody, they're nice. Maybe there's a little bit of a spark. Maybe there's even a lot of a spark. There's some spark, you like them, you're interested, you want to get something going. And then over time, you see that they're not going anywhere. Not only are they not going anywhere, but they're not making you nuts, blowing you off. They're like, free on Saturday. Hey, what would you like to do? What would you like to do? And I'm free during the day. And then, you know, we could have dinner together. They're present and they're not going anywhere. And they remain kind and they remain decent and they don't freak you out with that spicy unavailability or bad boy, bad girl, bad person kind of edge to them. That's not very nice. None of those things happen. And you think, well, I guess they're boring. I just guess they're boring. Or all of a sudden your sexual desire just plummets for them. It disappears. You start remembering someone else that was so hot, even though they made you crazy. All of a sudden they're looking really beautiful and you're thinking, I wonder if they're single now. All these kind of, or maybe maybe you notice like, oh, her ears are shaped funny. Or, <laughs> you know, I didn't realize it, but I hate his laugh. I can't be around his laugh. All these kind of things start happening and you feel like you have to leave. And I left at that point, thinking that I was too immature to find love, but knowing I couldn't stay because my interest had disappeared. And if I stayed, I'd feel suffocated. And I spent decades doing that until I was able to name what this was and with help, get out of it. And it's what I call the wave of distancing. Why is it a wave? Because a wave hits you, slams into you, maybe knocks you over, and then it passes. But I never waited long enough for it to pass. So for anybody who relates to this, if you have had a history, and the research actually backs this up, if you're someone who's had a history of being attracted to unavailable people, when you meet someone who's available and they start looking boring to you, celebrate because you are now in a new land and it's the land of availability. And it might seem boring, but it's nowhere near boring. It's real. So what do you do when the wave hits you? You do two things. One, you don't force yourself to be more intimate than you're ready for. Let's say you had a dinner together, like an intimate romantic dinner, or one of you was gonna cook dinner and you feel like, I can't do it, I can't do it, I do, I'm not ready for that. Well, maybe you wanna go to the movies and just hold hands, or maybe you wanna go for a walk in the park with your dog. 
Things that add a little space because what you're experiencing is a spasm of fear manifesting itself as disinterest. Now, not always, maybe the person isn't right for you, but that's one thing you do. You, you don't suffocate yourself. The other thing you do is you don't flee. You stay present and you enjoy the parts you enjoy without putting yourself in situations that seem too intense and watch almost always the feelings will come back if you do that. And when they come back, they will come back with an extra added, an extra added gift. You will have a clearer sense when the feelings come back of how right this person is for you or not. Nobody taught me that. And nobody teaches us, most of us, about this wave. Someone described it to me as like when the wave hits, it's like taking a canoe, there's the river, you've been on the river with the canoe, but you have to walk over some gravel to get there. But now when you know you have to drag this boat over some gravel, but it's not gonna last before you hit the water, you can behave differently. So this is a key for me that you know wasn't easy to learn, but makes a huge difference. So I'm glad that I get to share that with everybody. Yeah, I think it's so powerful because particularly if we're kind of more used to these um, attractions of deprivation, we can almost have a reaction like uh, I'm reminded of the Groucho Marx quote that says, I don't want to yeah. be a member of any club that would have me as a member. It's kind no of like, I don't want to be in a relationship is. with someone that's available for me. It's kind of like that's how our our reactions happen, right? And we feel so bad about it. Like, well, what is wrong with me? Am I that superficial? Am I that damaged? Probably for a period of time, but it will pass it will pass if you stay present with the person. That's the secret that is so wonderful. Will it come back again? Yeah, probably. And it'll come back at points when you're now ready to enter the next level of intimacy. That's when it's most likely to come back. But then you will have the tool to know how to get past those white waters, those difficult spots of the wave. Yeah, yeah, so beautiful. And I just love our conversations and I'm so grateful that we were able to connect again today. Always, always. The things that you share and the things that we've talked about, I think are just so, so important. It can make such a difference for people out there. And I'm just really, really grateful for you and the work you're doing. And I want to give a plug for your podcast because you just have this beautiful, soothing voice. I love to listen to your podcast not only for your wisdom, but just to hear your voice, it like calms me. I'm like, oh. it's almost like doing a meditation for me. So um, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, true. So I want everyone to check that out. And I know you also have a beautiful and generous gift for our listeners, which is a um, the first two stages of deeper dating part of your book. You want to just tell us real quickly about that and then we'll wrap up for today. Absolutely. And the other thing I just want to say is um, I want to invite everybody to go to deeperdating.com if you're single, only if you're single, and you can actually get on and start meeting people and connecting about he and hearing about events all for free. It's all completely for free, all meeting and messaging and everything as we launch. Um, so that's one thing. And my podcast is deeperdatingpodcast.com. And my book, Deeper Dating, was a number one Amazon bestseller in the arena of dating and relationships. And um, the first two chapters are so special to me. And you will get the full first two chapters plus the preface. Um, uh, that is the free gift. And in those first two chapters, you will learn to discover your core gifts, which are the central, most important dimension of a richer, wiser search for love. They are the genius and the magic of your authenticity, which is unique to you. And the first two chapters guide you through a process where you get to name your deepest core intimacy gift. So that's an incredibly precious part, you know, in my intensives, in my courses, we spent almost half the course just on those first two parts because they're so important. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the free gift as you get those first two chapters plus the preface for free of my book. Thank you so much, Ken. And I know everyone will want to take advantage of that and you'll just click on the link below, um, from this video that you're listening to watching 
And um, you can get that. And then you can also stay connected with my wonderful friend, Ken. And um, I'm really, really appreciative because I know this is going to give people not only inspiration, but hope as we begin this brand new year, Ken. And that, I believe, is so important because I believe that love can find a way even in the most unusual circumstances. I totally agree. And I think inspiration and hope are the hallmarks of the way you work, Michelle, which is why I'm always thrilled to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Really appreciate your presence and commitment to having the love and life that you want. Bye-bye for now.